Hi everyone, Sobia from Amazon Web Services, a startup solutions architect, and we're actually super excited to have a special guest today. So I would like to welcome Farah Salafi. Welcome Faris, it's really nice to meet you. So Faris, I've been hearing really amazing things that you've been working around and before we kind of get into it, as I know that you've been super, super um, committed to building and working on things around generative AI, posting your stuff online for everyone to know, let's just start with learning a bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Faris al I'm 12 years old and I grew up in the United States, specifically in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, because of Seattle's tech environment, uh, it's one of the things that really, you know, encouraged me to embark on this journey. Now, uh, from a young age, I've been really interested in technology, uh, generative uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, microcontrollers, and wow. things like that. Yeah, so uh, I was really interested in programming uh, from being young. Uh, as I grew, like, my interest changed, quantum computing, microcontrollers, mm-hmm. things like that. And uh, so far, I've been really interested in AI, uh, machine learning, and generative uh, AI intelligence. A- AI. So that's one of the things that's really interesting me currently. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I really care about like making a change on the world, like right. doing something important for humanity. Okay. Yeah. So that's really my goal is to like build technology and AI that helps humanity. Uh, yeah. Whether it be, for example, like n- like AI that's able to, for example dissect CT scans okay or helping wow. doctors or things like that mm-hmm. that's really what I'm currently like uh, what what I care about and that's really what I aim to do that's awesome to hear and it's actually very inspiring there's a lot of stuff that you've been doing so from my understanding you've been actually a really young coder and you've been working on many different you know uh, let's say avenues whether that be you know uh, generative AI of course using microcontrollers or uh, dabbling in quantum computing given the hype around generative AI and you know uh, the amount of work that you're doing I just want to know what's like the coolest thing that you've built so one of the coolest things I've built is uh, I custom trained a model called Falcon Mind 3B. Mm-hmm. I based this on the original Falcon 3B model from TII. Right. And what I did is I basically distilled it from a larger reasoning model. Okay. And I distilled it to be able to think step by step. Right. So let's say you had the original model, Falcon 3B. You would ask right. it a question, it, it would give you an answer. That's okay. it. Okay, yeah. For Falcon Mind 3B, uh, you ask it a question, it's like, Things in steps. Step one, uh-huh. I need to dissect the question. Step two, etc., etc. Okay. Uh, and after that, it gives you the final answer. And this has improved accuracy in multiple tests. Oh, all right. So yeah. that's that's amazing. And so, from my understanding, you kind of fine tuned this model, right? Yeah. Um, and the idea was to use, I'm guessing, chain of thought over yes. here to basically improve on the reasoning aspect. So it kind of breaks yeah. down into multiple steps yeah. uh, so it has the time to think about it okay exactly. and so then what kind of data set did you train this on so i g- generated a synthetic data set from quen with questions preview 32b okay uh, i generated the synthetic data set with i think around 500 examples wow. i don't remember exactly but i generated it and i fine-tuned uh, this model now i want to talk a bit about the novel techniques i used Okay. Uh, I use some techniques such as QLoRa, uh, which is quantization in LoRa. So LoRa is a lowering adaptation. Mm-hmm. So you have this model. Now, instead of changing every single weight based on the new training data, what yeah. you do is, uh, because that's really resource intensive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you, instead of like changing everything, you have an adapter layer. So you mm-hmm. basically have an extra adapter that changes the model outputs yeah. based on this new data and you just attach it on top. Okay. Yeah, and that's like way less resource int- intensive. That's r- that's actually interesting. So let yeah. me think about it. You generated a synthetic data set of just comprising 500 examples, so that's very yeah. small, and then you use that to fine tune the model to improve on its uh, reasoning capabilities. Yes. And then how much was the accuracy that you achieved? Now, I di- haven't run any benchmarks so far, Okay. but uh, there was a significant increase in accuracy based on like tests that I tried out the model and right. compared it with Falcon 3B. And then all of this, how much time did it take to just build all this? Uh, I'd say maybe a week or two, 
that's amazing that's brilliant so in a very short period of time you were able to kind of fine-tune a model and then improve its uh, reasoning capabilities to a certain let's say accuracy yes. level and this was all just by you know using uh, well-known techniques like QLORA, yeah. using mm -hmm. synthetic data set which is also an upcoming trend that we see with a lot yes. of applications that's really amazing and given that let's say you're taking a week to work on this and I'm assuming you, you have a wide range of interests. Where do you see, um, you know, generative AI being used? Like, do you use it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? Are there any challenges that you're facing when you use it? What, what, what's that like? So I do use generative AI on a like day-to-day -day basis. Some things I use it for are, for example, coding, text generation. Okay. And uh, to be honest, I've replaced search engines entirely. Because oh, wow. like generative AI, for example, deep deep search, deep searching, it scrolls through websites, it checks every detail on websites, right? Uh, it scours the internet and it finds you whatever answer you want. I see. Yeah. So it's much like much easier than, for example, uh, using a traditional search engine. Traditional search engine. Yeah. Okay. Some challenges I've faced are hallucinations and bias. Okay. Hallucinations mean that the model generates fake information. Right. This can be problematic for obvious reasons. Yeah. You don't want fake information. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so bias is where the like the model is. So th there's like some different inconsistencies in the training data, and this introduces yeah. bias. For example, favoring a certain group or censoring mm -hmm. certain things. That can be problematic when you want Very a fully truthful answer. It's amazing that you've actually highlighted two key problems that we're seeing. One is being hallucination, which is an upcoming problem. Uh, w especially with generative AI applications, but bias in general has been a very old problem within machine learning yeah. uh, for a very long time. And I like that you kind of you know hit the nail you know right on the on the head, yeah. basically saying that it could favor groups, and that's very problematic. And I think this is a really great way to think about what work you've been actually give, contributing to the community. What I've noticed is that you have a presence online on YouTube, as well as um, you're writing a lot of articles on Medium. And what I'm thinking about is like, what's the motivation behind that? And what impact do you hope to, to provide to other young tech enthusiasts? So really what motivates me usually is uh, that like many people, have, like from people I know, they've seen what I've done and they just encourage me to share it. So right. that's really what I did. And I also really enjoy seeing what people have done with what I made. Mm. Uh, and seeing what they think about it. Now, I do see, or I did notice that there's this problem where lots of novel techniques are locked in research papers, uh, and there's no real implementation because most of it is mathematics, and right. there's no example code or there's no open like things exactly. that are available. Yeah, libraries that are available. So that's one of the things that I'm trying to I'm trying to like bridge the gap between research I and see. practical implementation. That's yeah. brilliant. I I really love that. You know, I also read academic research yeah. papers from time to time because I think it's really important to also keep up to date yeah. everything that's going on we're just moving so fast and every new yeah. day either a new model comes out a new technique comes yeah. out a new paper comes out but you're absolutely right in trying to highlight that sometimes all that information is just locked into the research paper yeah. and if somebody's interested in learning a bit more they will might have to spend more time just figuring out this you know just how to put that together so yeah. I like that in, in your own way, the way that you're contributing is, I believe, bridging the gap, uh, yeah. showing that what you're seeing as an academic research is actually uh, could be translated to code. Because sometimes you're right, there's no code repo. Yeah. <laughs> there's just mathematical equations. And you're like, OK, I can translate that. But w what else do I do? Like, is yeah. there something I can reference? And that's, that's actually brilliant. I really, really love yeah. that. You've actually been trying to translate academic research to practical uh, applications. And given that you're part of the community and you're getting this feedback, what's your thought process like of coming up with new ideas? And can you can you provide some examples on what you're working on and what's your routine like? So usually I try to look for a problem that has not been solved that I can solve with technology mm -hmm. or a, a problem that has been solved, but like I try to optimize that solution for it. Okay. Yeah. So some examples of what I'm working on is I've noticed that there's a lack in compute, uh, like current compute for GPUs and that kind yes, of thing. Yes, and a lot, yeah, lots of people are you know taking more uh, care into privacy. I see. Yeah, privacy first AI. Yeah. So what I'm currently trying to do 
is build an extremely small reasoning model, like sub-300 million parameters. I see. Yeah, that's able to run on, for example, like a phone. And I'm trying oh, wow. yeah, I'm trying to get it to work with live video and audio. Like, I think there's ChatGPT Advanced Voice, mm. where you can show things around, it can talk to you live. Exactly. So that's really what I'm trying to do, but local. Like, it can run on a phone. I love the idea. So if I get it correctly, you are taking a smaller... Uh, model of lesser parameters i think uh in in the million parameters yeah. and then you're attempting it to run on a mobile phone okay that's amazing already what are the techniques that you're using to to a- achieve this so uh currently i'm using a few techniques mm-hmm. uh, i'm using distillation so we have a larger model like deepseek r1 right. and it's teaching the smaller model okay i'm um, also using quantization which is maintaining accuracy while lowering compute and I'm using Unsloth, which is a state-of-the-art algorithm, which allows for using much less compute for fine-tuning and inference Okay. Uh, while maintaining accuracy. So those are some of the techniques I'm using. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. So that is just mind-blowing. I really hope to learn more about it soon because I think you're yeah. still in development phase. Yes. And hopefully we can see it on a YouTube or another Medium article, yeah. just you talking about your your experience and your um, you know process with it. Yeah. So I am actually working on a, I'm trying to build a text diffusion model, which is different from autoregressive models, which right. generate token by token. Yes. Instead, this generates the whole response and refines it until it thinks it gets it right. Hmm. Uh, I want to talk about a few benefits for this, which are that it's theoretically better at reasoning and it's extremely fast. Mm-hmm. So the reason it's theoretically better at reasoning, nobody has really tested it yet, but uh, it's because it really models how the human brain works. So us humans, we think about an idea, we refine it until we get what we think is the correct answer. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, this model does the same. And I actually, I think there was one company, Inception. Mm-hmm. Uh, they built a model called Mercury, and it's the first uh, like commercial grade diffusion model. I see. And it does show lots of, uh, it shows like better speed ups, and it shows some benefits. See. So if I can get this to work, I'm gonna try to implement it into the phone pr- the extremely small reasoning model i talked about earlier on the phone yeah so yeah. we can have okay. like larger models oh but it's okay. diffusion so it runs much faster i see yeah that's actually very interesting so so in my in in that sense are you trying to also open source this work that you're doing yes. which is a bit different from um you know the the yeah. other model you're mentioning so I, I am really involved in the open source community i see and i want to give back mm-hmm. so that's one of the reasons I'm also open sourcing. Uh, I want to open source most of the things I do or everything I do so I can like give them back to the community. That's amazing. Yeah. And I think, I think that's brilliant. I love that idea. Definitely, there's a lot of work, good work that we could do by contributing to the open source community. There's such yes. a wide importance around it. Of course, there's a commercially grade models and that's yeah. a different thing. Open source is also a great way for people to just start and yeah. people to share and learn what's going on. And it's just a whole nother um, area that I actually yeah. really love within this. So Faris, you actually mentioned earlier that you've been dabbling a lot in robotics and healthcare. And I was just wondering how could you bring AI into this and how could you actually yeah. help to improve these fields? So uh, I have been working in robotics and healthcare. Mm-hmm. I'd like to give an example. Let's start with robotics. Mm-hmm. So I actually worked on a competition where we were detecting oh, wow. people with uh, LIDAR sensors and we were training a model to be able to detect people and basically simulate like uh, an autonomous vehicle right. to help autonomous vehicles like drive better and be careful of surroundings. That's really nice. Yeah. It's very interesting with the autonomous vehicles, very yes. synonymous to a very famous uh, product that we see. Where yeah. else have, been, have you been using uh, AI, for example, in other fields? So uh, I have used it in healthcare. Right. Where I've been trying to uh, like basically train a model to detect uh, cardio tumors uh, in MRI scans, so I think we could improve this with like the release of vision language models, which are VLMs. Right. So I was training a traditional just like CNN. Yeah. And uh, that doesn't really give you insights. You can't ask it about why is this happening, uh, what type of tumor do you think be. it is, yeah. this and that. So with VLMs, you could ask it. Uh, like you're able to talk with language yes. and it's able to see vision. 
That's really yeah. interesting. I, I love the fact that you brought that up because in, in my past, I was using DICOM images or basically mammograms yeah. to work on certain use cases. And obviously, I use traditional machine learning. It's really interesting that you try to bring in generative AI as yeah. a spin to it. You know, you can use text and images to yeah. basically figure out uh, problems. And it's a, yes. it's a very interesting topic that you brought because definitely this could really help and benefit the, the community. Yeah. So I really enjoyed having a conversation with you, Faris, and just learning about the work that you're doing. It's amazing to see how you're thinking about the community, you're yeah. thinking about sustainability, and you're also trying to find ways to even help uh, specific you know, industries like healthcare, like doctors. And you know, with that, I have one last thing to ask you. What advice would you like to give to young tech developers or young tech enthusiasts that want to start building um, with AI? Say whatever you want in the camera. So really, what I would recommend for anyone who wants to get into AI, start with practical projects, fine tune a model, run some inference or anything like that. Just get the gist of it. And also read research papers, but don't just read them normally, read it critically. Why did they choose this architecture? Could I do this better? Uh, what benefits are there to this? And after you get the gist of it, after you understand AI, like look for a problem that you can solve. Look for a problem you can solve with technology or with AI, artificial intelligence, or generative AI. And that's really what I would recommend for anyone who wants to get started with AI.